5, L5S1. We don't think L3-4 is painful, but we're going to be testing it to see if it is. If it is, we'll treat it. If it's not, we leave it alone. But very confident L4-5, L5S1 are the discs that are causing this patient's back pain. The only question is, is L3-4? Now, um, <coughs> the most common discs in the body to cause pain in the lumbar spine in particular are L4-5, L5-S1 in that order. They account for about 85% of chronic back pain when the disc is the cause of back pain, when the disc is the source. We call that discogenic back pain. Dr. Duke here, are you okay? Can you hear me? We're gonna get started, okay? You're gonna, f you're gonna feel a little stick and burn, all right? That's just the medicine going in. So bear with me. Don't move your body, just say ouch if it hurts and I'll give you more medicine. I'll let you know if there are any problems, okay? Deal? So you say, ouch, if you feel pain, but don't move. Since you're awake for the beginning, it's important that you lay still and just tell me if you're feeling some discomfort. Just say, ouch, but don't move your body in response, okay? How's our blood pressure? We need it down. I need a 110. So can you get it down? Just let me know when you're ready. So just to reiterate, um, the discs are very commonly a cause of chronic back pain or neck pain or thoracic pain. When people have chronic neck, back, or thoracic pain over the spine. And the disc can only be a source of pain when it's been injured. And the injury is always the same. It's a tear in the annulus fibrosis, which is the wall around the, the disc that holds the jelly in the center. The jelly is called the nucleus propulsus. So for someone to have pain coming from a damaged disc, they need to have an annular tear with the nuclear material in the center that squeezes out either a little bit or a lot of it, but there needs to be an amount of nucleus wedged in between the annular tear fibers. And that is called interposed disc herniation, interposed, because the nuclear fragments or pieces that are stuck between the annular tear are interposed between the torn edges of the annulus. So it's called the interposed herniation. Okay, it's the interposed herniation or nuclear material nucleus propulsus, that is responsible for creating inflammation, chronic inflammation, therefore pain that comes from chronic inflammation in the outer wall of the disc called the annulus fibrosis. Let me know when you're ready, please. So patients with chronic back or neck pain that comes from a herniated or bulging disc, and a bulge is the same thing as a herniation, it's just a small herniation, those patients have their pain coming from, can you grab my phone? They have their pain coming from uh, the disc herniation. They have it coming from the annulus fibrosis and the inflammation within the annulus fibrosis. So the goal of the Duke Laser Disc Repair, it's the first surgery in the world to ever um, target the annular tear as the source of back pain, neck pain, thoracic pain, and use a laser to repair the annular tear by by debriding the tear, and then allowing the tear to heal over time. So, I'm the pioneer of the procedure, and I've been doing it now 15 years, and we're talking here and not doing any surgery because we're waiting for the blood pressure to come down. So our anesthesiologist is treating the patient's blood pressure and bringing it down a little bit, and we're waiting. I wanna wait till the blood pressure is around 110. I don't want it over 115. I want it somewhere between 90 and 110 um, to proceed. 
And the reason for that is the higher the blood pressure, the more pressure there is in the blood vessels. So we're going to be doing surgery. And when you do surgery, inevitably, you're going to cut some blood vessels with your tools as you cut the skin and pass through the muscle and then enter the epidural space in the foramen. And so you're, it's impossible to do it without having some contact or mi minor tears of the blood vessels, small blood vessels, not big ones, small ones. And that's na natural and normal for any surgery, period. So when you do get that tear, you want it to stop right away. And the reason it stops right away is for a variety of reasons, but one of them is if the blood pressure is too high, it won't stop right away. So if you keep your blood pressure down lower, then it will, it will stop right away and flood off. Um, so we want to make sure as a surgeon, when you're operating on someone's spine, you always manage the blood pressure really well. I do that for all my surgeries. Um, when I was a resident, I wasn't taught to do that. I went to a very good training program, one of the best in the world. And we always left the blood pressure control and management to the anesthesiologist. We just let them do what they want. That's what every other surgeon does. There's only a few circumstances where the surgeon intervenes on the blood pressure of the patient during surgery. And those are special unique circumstances for special types of surgery, like arterial venous malformation surgeries or aneurysm surgeries vascular surgery, cardiac surgery, but in neurosurgery and spine surgery, there's really no situation where the surgeon intervenes and tells the anesthesiologist where the blood pressure should be. So that was one of the things that I learned early on is that you can really reduce the amount of intraoperative blood loss when the surgeon works with the anesthesiologist together collaboratively to keep the blood pressure down below 110 millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure. So that's why I'm a, a stickler for it, because you don't get these bleeding complications that occur like hematomas or uh, anemia that occur with um, too much bleeding in the operating room. The other day, we did a posterior cervical laminectomy infusion. This is uh, normally a liter of blood loss. That's 1,000 cc's that most surgeons lose during the surgery. We went from C3 to T2, so the entire cervical spine basically below C2 and into the thoracic spine. We did laminectomy, foraminotomies at each level, and instrumentation infusion. We did all of that with a blood loss less than 20 milliliters. Now, most surgeons do it for 1,000. So how are we able to keep our blood loss so low? Well, there's a variety of things, but one of them is blood pressure control. So we're waiting right now for the blood pressure to get under control. From now on, Luis, you're at a level where this stuff shouldn't happen. You walk in the room, tell the anesthesiologist, systolic blood pressure 110 or lower for the surgery. You know, So that way I'm not coming in here wasting my time and the patient's not wasting their time and we get the blood pressure where we need it to be, okay? Um, so let's get back to the discussion of the source of back pain and neck pain when you have a herniated disc is actually the annular tear. And I've been talking about the annular tear and the small herniation or big herniation as the cause of the inflammation within the annular tear. But I haven't talked about the locations of the annular tear that cause pain. And it's very specific. If the annulus is torn in the back of the disc, posterior, it will cause lo highly localized pain. Highly localized means the patient will feel exactly where it's coming from. They'll be able to point to it. When the tear in the annulus occurs on the sides of the disc or the front of the disc, it doesn't, it doesn't cause pain ever. Um, I've never once re repaired an anterior or lateral annular tear with herniation ever because they don't cause pain. So there's no need to ever treat a lateral or anterior annular tear with herniation. Even though they happen a, a lot, um, the only painful ones are the ones in the back of the disc, posterior. So that's whether it's cervical, thoracic, or lumbar, it's only the posterior herniations that cause pain. And it has to do with one thing and one thing alone that people have hinted at, but no one's really understood. It's called the sinovertebral nerve. You see, orthopedics know about it. Neurosurgeons ignore it. But the reality is that the sinovertebral nerve has branches to the back of the disc. And those nerve branches are sensory branches. And most specifically, they're somatic afferent branches. How do I know all this? I was basically a neuroanatomy star. 
So what does that mean? Well, it means I took neuroanatomy very seriously. And if you go back and look at my medical school training, you'll see that I was number one in my class in neuroanatomy, that I was invited by USC Med School to teach neuroanatomy my fourth year of med school, the first time they ever invited a student who's currently enrolled in medical school to teach at the medical school. And I taught first and second year students neuroanatomy as a faculty instructor. And of course they paid me, they actually paid me $30,000 to do that for the year, which is the first time they ever paid a student. And basically it wiped out my, my uh, tuition for the fourth year of med school. So I borrowed money to go to med school my first three years, but my fourth year was free because I taught neuroanatomy. And the first time the school's ever asked a student in their history of 125 years to teach as a faculty member. So it was quite an honor. I also won the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles Retzius Neuroanatomy Competition. It's an international competition and where they invite neuroradiologists, neurosurgeons, neurologists, neuroanatomists, neurophysiologists to come and compete once a year. And they ask the toughest anatomy questions uh, possible with slide presentations showing nuclei, tracks, brain nuclei, tracks down the spinal cord, um, tracks within the brain, nerves, everything, normal anatomy, and they ask questions. You have to do a fill in the blank answer. Long story short, it's the only neuroanatomy comp competition in the world held every year in Los Angeles, and I won that competition. So I won it with only one mistake. I had 49 out of 50 questions right. That's the highest score anyone has ever achieved. The neurosurgeons at USC, which are very good, they ended up missing 20 questions. And so I was the only one to miss one question. So how is my neuroanatomy knowledge? It's, it's consummate. It's very, very good. And I learned neuroanatomy because I knew I needed to have a very good understanding of the anatomy to be able to do good surgery. Are we ready yet? Close? That's not good enough. Let's get it down a little more. What are you doing to drop the pressure? All right, good. Um, yeah, that's understandable. So if we could do just do a few more points, I'll be happy. Just keep it under one. Just get it under 120, and I'll be happy. All right. So why is it no one else has figured out the nerve and innervation to the back of the disc? Probably because the right person hasn't come along. That's really what it comes down to. That's how discoveries are made. All these things about our world around us, they're all, they all exist, they're facts. The first person that discovered bacteria, the first person that used the microscope, the first person discovered penicillin kills bacteria. I mean, these are all things that were going on for thousands or millions of years. And somebody came along and, and made the right observation and, and claimed it as fact. So same thing happens in medicine all the time no surprise, but what I've discovered in my career as a discovery is that the innervation to the back of the disc is very unique. Somatic afferent, highly localized. Lay still, please. Don't try to pick your head up. And as a result, patients who have problems with the back of their disc with inflammation, they're going to feel it as highly localized pain. All right, we're going to get started. Our blood pressure is under better control. And I think I've taught all of you the physiological and anatomical and neurophysiological basis of localized pain from a herniated disc posteriorly due to the annular tear and the extravasated nucleus propulsus. Let's get a shot. We're gonna use our x-ray machine now, lateral, to guide this, this spinal needle down to the discs. Now, um, L5S1 is one of the discs we're treating. It's also the hardest one to get to with uh, transfer aminal approach. As a matter of fact, 90% of endoscopic surgeons don't even try. They, um, they just won't even treat L5S1 transfer aminally. They only go interlaminar. I've had really good luck and success with doing it. 
What do you think we need to do there, Jordan? Yeah, we need to do something because we're offset that way. I don't think that made it better, do you? I think it got worse. And then we need to wag a little bit as well. I do a little more. Let's see if we can get that a little better. So what we're doing, folks, before I go any further with the needle, there's no point in me trying to get into the disc without having the x-ray lined up perfectly. That's pretty close, but it's still off a bit. Let's try to get those facets lined up and the... So before you go anywhere near the spine and the nerves with your surgical approach, I think that's a little better. Let's see if we can wag just the tiniest bit, maybe a degree or two to get that end plate of five at the bottom there. I'm going for five one first. See, if, so <clears throat> before you, you do anything, you really want to have your, your x-ray picture, which you're gonna use one more time for navigating. You wanna have that set up perfectly, as, as good as you can get it. And you're gonna have limitations, okay? The limitations will be primarily patient limitations like scoliosis or kyphosis or um, bone spurs and, and thickened bone, hypertrophic bone, and all those things are going to limit your ability to see what you need to see. All right, I think it's definitely better. It, I don't do anything yet. I'm just kind of looking at it, trying to see the anatomy. I'm looking at the pedicles. They're overlapping, I believe. The end plate of five is almost good. Maybe we can do a little more wag one way or the other. So I can't tell you how many doctors that, that do this kind of like needles near the spine, they don't get the x-ray lined up perfectly and they end up hurting a nerve or something. Patients come out with injuries they shouldn't have. So we're taking our time to do it right. We need a good map, a trusty map. Otherwise, we'll navigate our boat onto a coral reef and sink the ship and we don't wanna do that. We've gotta have a reliable map and that's what the x-ray produces as a map. All right, um, and the coastline is always changing, so. Are you comfortable? Just lay still, you're doing great. All right, we're going for L5S1, that's the hardest one. You, if you, you close that uh, collimator too much. Sean? A little bit higher than I wanna be. Where do you feel that, Sean? Huh? All right, lower back. I need to know if you feel it down your leg, okay? Let me know if you feel it down the leg. We're not trying to go make it go down the leg, Sean, but if you do feel it down the leg, I need to know. Does that make sense? Sean? So I'm, I pulled back a little bit, and I'm going to re approach this. Sean? Yeah. I, th I think we're still um, not wagged, but rotated off a little bit. I think that's better, right, Luis? It looks better. Yeah, so we're just up against the facet. That's where we are. Where do you feel that, Sean? Upper back? Lower back. Lower back, all right. I apologize for the discomfort, Sean. We're almost there, but try not to move, okay? Sean, anything in your leg? Huh? Sean? Hmm. Sean, he's moved again, so we need to re... Try not to move, okay, because we have to reset the x-ray machine every time. Just lay still. I know it's a little bit uncomfortable. There's going to be a little bit of discomfort. But everything's going okay. I'll let you know if there's a problem. I don't think that's better. Yeah, I 
think that's probably better. It's hard to say. I think we're close. I don't. I think that's better. Let's just leave it there. Okay. Let's leave it there. Shot. Shot. AP. Nothing down your leg. All right. So for those of you watching, we are gaining access to L5S1. I always target 5-1 first. Um, hmm. You have the lateral view still? That's where that is. That's where we are. Mm. Now he's got some scoliosis you can see he's also got a little bit of abnormality with his posterior um, elements like his lamina it's it's not really it's almost a spina bifida occulta really which is an abnormal fusion of the posterior elements at S L5 all right um, Let's go back to a lateral view, please. But you can see there's some twisting of the vertebrae and the L5 is twisted relative to S1 and L4 is twisted relative to L5. So you're never gonna get a perfect view of all the vertebrae because they're twisted with respect to each other. Um, so we need to um, basically just do the best we can with what we have as we always do, shot. And hopefully we're gonna be able to access the L5S1 level. Anything? Huh? I'm up against something and I'm not seeing it on really on the x-ray, am I? A p a lateral. I'm probably hitting the the end plate of five. Can you wag that a little more? It looks like it's somehow moved. How much did you wag it, Sean? That's worse. I think that's worse, right? Let's go the other way. That's, I think that's better. Sorry, we're getting there. It's just taking us a little while, Sean. I think now that you've wagged it, it looks. Maybe we're over rotated. What do you think? Yeah, no, the blood pressure is fine at this point. Maybe bring that down a little bit. Let's see what happens a little bit. It seems to be better with the sacrum, but and maybe L5. Try a little more. I'm getting a double shadow on the superior facet of L5. Try a little more. Let's see if the double shadow separates or comes together. Shot. I, it got worse, so go the other way. Stop and shot. That definitely got better. And then, so the, do a little bit more, like another degree shot. Yeah, so the problem is the rotation of five on one. If we get five lined up perfectly lateral to five, then S1 is out of alignment. That's because there's scoliosis at five one. There's rotation in between the two vertebrae. So we're not gonna get it perfect. Um, but we're gonna have to get as close to it as we can. So I'd rather be closer. What happened? You don't move the base. Yeah, don't move the base. Let's see where we are. One more shot. I wonder if we can get the end plate of, I think that's probably good. That's probably good. Lock it there. Let's see if we can do it with this. Shot. Yeah, it's too high getting deflected shot
shot. 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 No, it takes a set. Shot. Are you comfortable? Shot. Shot. And the sacrum is rotated. Let's get an AP, see where we are. We have a couple questions. Sure. One of the viewers is wondering, Dr. Duke, why does the cold weather cause spine pain? Why does the cold weather cause spine pain? That's a great question. I honestly can't answer that for you because I don't think anyone knows for sure why cold weather causes spine pain. We, we published an article recently on that on our website and talked about um, some changes, physiological changes. Sh Sean, would you repost that, that uh, post so they could have it? Yes, I will. Yeah. But I think the, the, the honest answer is that nobody knows for sure. Where do you feel that? Nobody knows for sure, shot. Lateral. Why people's joints ache during the cold weather. Shot. Shot. We have another question. Sure. Shot. One of our viewers wants to know how do you distinguish the pain caused by a herniated disc from things like piriformis syndrome? Oh, it's easy on the physical exam. Shot. The piriformis muscle is nowhere near the uh, the disc. It's below. You just have to push on the piriformis muscle and you'll see the pain. Shot. That's where we are. Mm -hmm. Shot. And you're pulsing, right? Shot. 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 Yeah, let AP. Yeah, piriformis syndrome is pain in the buttock, top of the buttock. And the piriformis pain is very different than disc pain. It just takes a good examination. Lateral. There's no MRI, CAT scan, or test that will tell you what causes pain. It's all done on the physical exam. You have to do a physical exam on the patient to figure that out. So that's what I would recommend. All right, so we need to get around that facet joint and it keeps, it's enlarged and it's pushing us to the side. So I'm gonna try a little bit different approach See if we can't get there. Shot. 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 It keeps pushing me. 
Anything? No? You don't feel anything? Chuck? Let's go AP. I didn't hear what he said. No. No. Let's see. So you have to use fluoroscopy to do this procedure. You have to use an x-ray machine. You go front and back. Sorry, front and back and then side to side. That looks pretty good. Let's go back to the lateral, please. And use the lateral view, which is side to side, and use the AP view. We call it anterior posterior view to navigate. Now, some people also will use an oblique view. And again, for some reason, we're off. Release the wag again. Shot. Uh, shot. Lock it there. No pain. Where do you feel it? Lower back. Shot. Shot. Are you okay? Huh? What do you feel? Anything? Just lower back. I want to make sure we're in. I believe we are. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? 10? That was your L5S1 disc, okay? I apologize. I had to test it. I normally do that later, but I wanted to make sure we're inside your disc, and we are. So that's the good news. That's the hard one, by the way, the L5S1. Huh? Yeah. Is that the typical pain you get? All right. Thank you. Yes, concordant. So we're going we're gonna to be done soon with the part where I need you awake, okay? And I'll be able to put you to sleep soon. Are you comfortable? All right. So a lot of people uh, around the world, for one reason or another, but for wrong reasons, don't believe uh, in discography, that it actually helps or works. And discography is what we just did. We test the disc to see if it's causing pain. It's obviously invasive. It lay still. Shot. And it requires putting a needle into the disc. So we have to do that for the surgery anyway, Sean. Um, you know, to do the surgery, Sean. So since we had to put a needle in the disc anyway to do the, lay still please, Sean. You're doing great, everything is going just fine. Please don't move though. It makes it a lot more difficult for us to do this. Sean. I'm right on the facet again. <laughs> what can we do to improve that? I think we need to rotate a little bit. Try one way, then the other. The wag looks okay. What do we do there? I think let's try something else, yeah. A little more. That didn't help. Uh, let's go back, I guess. A little bit, a little bit. That's that's fine. I can see four well. Five is a little catawampus because of the scoliosis. Um, but discography is a very useful tool. You're doing great. Are you comfortable? Yeah. All right, I apologize. Shot. I know this is not terribly comfortable for you, but we're almost done with the hard part. Shot. Pretty soon you'll be asleep, and then once you've woken up, we'll be done. Shot. Your uh, your spine is a little twisted, so it's giving us a hard time. Shot. Um, but it's not the first 
scoliosis surgery I've done. So it's just about being persistent and finding the right path around the twisted spine bones. John, are you comfortable? No pain? Where? John, in your back? Yeah, just don't move, okay? Where do you feel it, your back? Leg, uh huh. How far down? All right. That's why we need you to lay still, though. Okay. What have you given them? I w I mean, like I said, I I would recommend looking at Santiago's records because he always had them. Perfect, but they were still responsive. Yeah. Well, I think. What did he, what did Santiago do? That's. I understand. Yeah, but he he's got a hundred cases like this. How many of these have you done? Less than 10, right? With me, less than 10. Yeah, nobody else does this. Shot. So, I understand. And I'm telling you, everyone, no one wants to admit, doctors are the worst. They are all arrogant, they all have big egos. They think, they think that they know the best. But what I'm telling you is since I've done 1,200 of these, I've seen every anesthesiologist, every technique, and there is a one that works consistently. And I'm trying to help you understand that. But I can't, you, can't, you can't get blood from a turnip, water from a stone, so it's okay. My recommendation is put a little more local. There's no, no, we're not gonna, you want me to put local by the nerve root? No, no. That's where we are. That's not the problem. It's a facet joint that's hurting him. Okay? I can't put local down there because it could affect the root. And then he won't. Shot. It's ketamine. Ketamine. Santiago used ketamine. Shot. I understand that. But he used a certain amount. That is that the shot? No, it's not. What are do you not paying attention, Jordan? Shot. shot. I can't have the patient moving around while I'm trying to place these needles. That's the problem. Okay. So, you know, Versed, if you, if that works, great. Shot. Of course. Versed, you're right. I don't want him to be asleep. That's why we don't use Versed. Shot. Keep his blood pressure down. Shot. Sorry about that. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you do, you're doing a great job. Shot. I apologize. We're just trying to figure out the right anesthetic to give you to make you comfortable so I can get this thing done. Shot. Huh? Where do you feel it? Just the back? Leg. Leg? Leg. How far down? Uh, to the knee. Huh? Knee. Oh, to the knee. Starting to the knee. But not past the knee. No. All right. Um, we need to improve that picture a little bit. I think we've wagged off a little. So let's see if we can wag it and get the end plate a little bit better. That's good. Actually, that's that's probably good right there. What? Yeah, you can pick your head up for a second. Do you have, he has a nasal cannula? What is he at? Two liter shot? 
We're so far away from the nerve root. AP? You're doing great. We're almost done with this disc, uh, getting into it, and then we're going to be able to put you to sleep soon. Hmm. All right, back to a, a lateral view. A little farther lateral than I want to be. Interesting. <laughs> so we're getting forced wide again. I'm going to try a different trajectory. And try to come in a little bit more lateral. Shot? Shot? Go AP. All right, lateral. You comfortable? Shot. 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 Let's get an AP, see where we are. Okay, lateral. Let's try to get our blood pressure down under the 120s, please. Almost done with you being awake, I promise. I apologize that it's been so uncomfortable for you. 
shot. 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 You're doing great. Almost done. Shot. He definitely has a tear there. You can feel it. How bad is that? Huh? I couldn't hear a number. Is that your typical back pain? Right where you felt it there? That is typical? That was your L3-4. So it's a good thing we did it. Huh? How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? Is that your typical pain? That was a 10. All right, you get to go to sleep now. When you wake up, we'll be done. What? Yeah. Can you count out loud from 1 to 100, please? Just lay still, please. Don't move your body. Just count out loud from 1 to 100. Keep going, you're doing great. All right, any questions from the audience, Sean? Shot? No, no, they're so far. Okay. Shot. 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 I just don't like that. I know it's rotated. See if you can get a better picture than that. Give me an AP. That's a better picture, by the way, Jordan, doesn't mean there's problem with graining or exposure. It means the angle is what I'm asking you for. Do you, do you understand that? Is that where you were adjusting? so bad on the lateral it looks good on the AP let's go back to a lateral view I think the problem is a scoliosis Really? It's 
it's not rotation that's necessarily the problem, though it probably is part of the problem. think that just let's leave that and see what where where we are here shot hmm. shot just not happy with that trajectory. I don't know what you've done there, but the fluoro shot is terrible. Let me have the needle. Jordan, so in my lifetime when I didn't do things right, I always felt really bad, and I tried to do it better next time. I don't sense that you're doing that. It, I think you think it's okay to take this many floor shots and not have it where we need it to be. That's not acceptable. You've got to start being a little harder on yourself to try to make it better. Look how bad that view is. So what need you, you figured out, right? We already figured out what needs to be done to make it better. You were there at one point. So you have to remember those coordinates and you have to put it back to that point. That's what you're supposed to do. Without, you know, using so much radiation that we're all gonna feel like Chernobyl in here. That's your job, okay? So I, I can't see your coordinates. I don't know where th it was that you had it at 5-1. That's what you're supposed to remember and do, right? So, so then I guess you're doing a good job, right? So what I would do if I were you is I would say, here's the coordinates and it looks terrible. So which way am I off? How can I improve this? And what happens is you get pretty good at figuring it out based on the body position, based on the anatomy you're looking at. And that's just not happening with you for some reason. You're going the opposite. Now that's much better. You can see how the pelvic rim has come in alignment. Are you able to help him? Huh? Well, I mean, that's not perfect there, but it, that's, that's a little better. But it's better in some ways, worse in others. Shot. <sighs> Shot. AP.
shot. Lateral. Have the dilator. Shot. 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 Dilator. I mean, a uh, tubular retractor. tells me I need to find the happy place at times like this. It's just so hard. Shot. 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 Still, for some reason, compressed. I'm not sure why. Why would that be? Just some tissue stuck in there? Yeah. It's probably in the tube still. So we're inside the disc. There's the herniation part of it, the annular tear. I don't think I can get any of this. It's very tough. So just use the laser. Laser on 30. So, so I don't have the same conversation with you as I do with Jordan. When I ask for the laser, you turn it on. Monica, did you hear what I said? You want to try again? Let's try again. All right. Laser. 
So at this point, it should be on and ready to go. Good. So this patient has a high iliac crest, which is why I had to start a bit higher and come down at an angle. It affects L5S1 access, not any other disc but L5S1. This is the annular tear we're debriding. 95% of the surgery is annular debridement. That's why it's a unique surgery because there is no other surgery in the world that is annular debridement but the Duke laser disc repair. Sean, any questions? Been so far. Thanks. A little bit of epidural blood. I'm happy our blood pressure is good. Thank you, I see that. So there's always gonna be veins in the epidural space. You are gonna transgress them, it's impossible not to. You're going through the foramen, the foramen is connected to the epidural space, Batson's plexus is there, lots of veins, you're gonna go through them. The key is that um, you keep your blood pressure under control. Make sure the patient stops their anticoagulation, antiplatelet therapy. There should be no blood thinners on board. Get them off ginkgo biloba, fish oil, turmeric, those types of herbal medications or treatments. They are all very bioactive. And they have uh, properties that cause bleeding, basically. Truly, they're... Uh, <laughs> probably very effective natural remedies to prevent stroke and heart attack, you know. They definitely make people's blood more uh, fluid, less likely to clot. So we stop all of those compounds in our patients. That's the tear we've been talking about. We've been debriding it. It's gonna continue. This is an old injury, you can see. All the golden calcifications. The gold comes from the laser's interaction with calcium. That's what creates that gold color. I'm struggling with the scope because this patient's uh, standby laser, this patient's iliac crest is so high that it's forced the angle of my scope, the angle down to the spine to be so steep that I'm actually hitting his ribs up here as I'm doing the surgery. Not hitting hard, but just coming up against them. And that's blocking my, my camera from rotating properly. So that's a true sign that your patient has a very high iliac crest, which definitely affects You'll, you'll know when I put the laser in, Monica, because Luis will hand it to me, okay? You can actually see that hand come right towards me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Luis is kind of hard to miss. He's a big guy. Why am I struggling getting that out?
Is the end working properly? Yes, Are the is. teeth aligning properly? Just about done here. just about done. That's the epidural space. We've debrided the tear. You've got some bleeding from the end plate of S1, no big deal. You got some foramenal ligament right here. It's actually kind of good, we're getting it. It's coming off the facet joint. And you got some epidural bleeding. Remember, this is all due to chronic inflammation. So there's more blood supply than normal to these tissues. Looking good. And pretty much, this is all disc material. It's all scarred up. Scarred from chronic inflammation. Simplest things to understand, yet people don't understand it. Beyond me why they don't. Honestly, standby laser. Scope off here. Nice job, Luis. All right, that's one down. So what I like to do is I like to apply some pressure to um, not the incision per se, because the incision is not bleeding in the skin, but the muscle that we pass through um, has veins in it. It's very vascular. Muscle is basically all blood vessels and muscle fibers. It's pretty much all it is. So anytime you pass through muscle, you're going to get some veins that tear and those veins will bleed a little bit. But if you put pressure and hold for three minutes, then that bleeding stops, as long as the patient's coagulation is normal. And so typically we get no bleeding at all, but everybody, every patient's a little different. Some have blood that's less likely to clot. Others have more veins and more vascular muscle. So there's all these little variables you can't control as a surgeon. But what you can do is just apply pressure for three minutes and you'll be fine. Keep the blood pressure under control, which his is. We've never had a complication, not a single one. And over the 1,200 of these surgeries I've done for 16 years, not a single complication, not an airway complication, not an anesthesia complication, not a surgical complication. So. It's a very safe surgery as long as it's done exactly right every time. But there's a lot of potential for complication. Don't get me wrong. This is not a surgery that you can just go and do and expect to have no complications. You have to be trained properly. You have to pay attention to all the details. It has to be done just right. If you're off by a few millimeters with this type of surgery in the lower back, you could actually end up with serious complications, okay? Vascular complications, neurological complication. So complications are very close. But you can avoid them as long as you follow the rules, the rules that I create as a result of me doing the procedure so many times and understanding the anatomy very well. We have a question. Yes. One of our users is wondering, what kind of laser do you use? Is it RF or CO2? 
The laser we use and we've been using for the last 16 years is the same exact laser we use all the time. We don't change lasers. And it, the laser's the laser's very important. Um, and it's a great question. I appreciate you asking it. The laser that we use is called a homium YAG laser. Homium YAG laser. Um, that's spelled H-O-L-M-I-U-M YAG. Y-A-G stands for yttrium argon garnet. And the actual manufacturer of the laser, I'm very particular. I've used the same one. What's the name of the company? L Lin Luminous? Sorry, Luminous. Um, Luminous, there's other manufacturers of homium YAG lasers, but I won't use them. And I think ours is an 80 watt or 100 watt, correct? 100 watt. 100 watt luminous. Is that Dr. Cuppinger that asked? No, it is not. He was asking me about the laser we used last week, actually over the weekend. So I figured that was him. Anyway, um, homium YAG and luminous, in my opinion, the best. The laser itself, uh, you know, the company uh, charges about 100 grand for the laser. And um, I wouldn't do the surgery without it. All right. Let's get on with the next disc is L45, lateral. Sorry. Shot. So as you're doing this, you want to be very careful. You don't want to advance the guide wire accidentally or pull it out accidentally. If you pull it out, you got to start over. Don't, don't try putting it back without starting over. Starting over means waking up the patient, making sure they're awake, participating, and then putting that guide, that needle back, the spinal needle, and then, you know, guide wire, everything. So you literally have to start over. It's, and that's fine. It's the right thing to do. You just don't want to blindly put it back. If you blindly put it back, you can hurt the patient very badly. Very badly. Your guide wire is your guide. Truly your guide. And if you, if you remove it accidentally while you're, you know, taking the spinal needle out, or even if you move it, remove it while you're putting the dilator in, like I am now, it can happen. Okay, it can happen if you're not careful and you don't do it right. You have to start over. You cannot just wing it. Winging it will cause injury to the patient and you'll never, I would never forgive myself. So, again, there are rules you have to follow to have a successful surgery. Shot. And you cannot compromise on those principles and rules shot if you do you're opening the patient and you up for a catastrophe this is spine surgery this is not Legos and uh, if you don't do it right well very very bad things can happen this is not a procedure meant to be done by anyone who isn't trained properly and has the right credentials to do it, okay? I know I make it look easy. I really do, I get it, but it's not easy. Don't do this at home, in your garage. We have a follow-up question to our last one. Sure. About how much does the homium YAG laser cost? A homium YAG laser, if it's in good operating condition, new. It's uh, about a $120,000 investment. If it's used and old, probably less, but you gotta be careful. Buying used medical equipment is not a good idea most of the time, unless you really know what you're doing. Most people don't. You'll, get, you'll buy a, a laser that doesn't work properly. 
if your laser doesn't work properly, well, it's not going to do its job right. So, I would recommend you buy a new one. I'm a big buyer of used equipment. Uh, as long as the equipment you're buying is, is functional, it's good to save money. For example, these lights in the operating room that light up this operating table, they're buy used. I bought them used, but don't buy a laser used. It's a mistake. Uh, I don't buy used fluoros. Hmm. We're really stuck there. Wait, let me just see, Luis, before you do that. I don't recommend buying a uh, used laser. Oh, it's working. Nice. See, this is one of our little tricks. Shot. We have a few more. I only have one glove, right? Yeah, that's good. So it's an expensive piece of equipment. Um, you know, the total setup is a couple of million dollars to do this right. And of course you need a facility and you need staff. So this, these surgeries get very expensive very quickly. Oh, and you need an anesthesiologist. Did I tell you that? This, maybe it's just calcified disc. All right. Well, that's inside the disc, folks, and it's just really in bad shape. That's a piece of herniation. Our blue dye that we use stains the degenerated nuclear material blue. It don't, doesn't stain the annulus. The annulus stays white. Now, the annulus could have some blue, blue color if there's interposed nuclear material, right? We talked about that. Laser. So if there's interposed nuclear material, the annulus will be still white. The fibers of the annulus will be white, but the, uh, the overall coloration will not be white. It will be a bluish white because look at that calcification. Holy mackerel. That's a calcified herniation. A little bit of end plate maybe too. Yeah, 20 year history of back pain. Of back pain. Yeah, nice job. Beautiful. So my nurse is so smart. She's using her brain. She went to the chart and found out that this patient has a 20 year history of back pain, which you know, when you see this kind of calcification right here that we're seeing at the bottom of the laser, that degree of calcification tells you this is an old injury. This is probably the best technique in the world for figuring out if a patient has um, a recent injury to their disc or a more remote injury to the disc. And we're actually looking inside the disc itself. So we have a phenomenal view of the age of the disc injury with this procedure, the Duke Laser Disc Repair. We're able to age these injuries to a limited degree, obviously, but more so than any radiologist could do or any, uh, any other do doctor can do. This is the most reliable technique in the world for aging a spinal injury when it involves the disc. So yeah, we see a lot of calcified herniation here. A lot of um, inflammatory tissue, young inflammatory tissue still right here. This pinkish stuff is called granulation tissue. It's full of little pain fibers that you don't really want there. 
Oh yeah, see all the pinky, pinky stuff zapping away. All right, we've got another 15 minutes. We should be done with this surgery. You can see the end plate of L5 down there. You see it right there, right through that window. That's the L5 superior end plate. This is all badly damaged disc. We're gonna zap this stuff away, clean it up. It's amazing, the disc will heal itself once you remove this grunge. I call it grunge, it's basically, um, deep. we call it devitalized tissue in the business, in the business of surgery, it's called devitalized tissue. I don't know where that term came from, I didn't make it up. It's, you know, if you think what's vitality, devitalized means it lost its vitality. I guess it's an old term, must be an old Latin term. But it's uh, a surgical term, devitalized tissue. And it doesn't mean it's infected, it means it's damaged and basically all scarred up like this. So it's no longer functional and it's uh, not basically not helping your body. In a way, it's not a foreign body, it's not foreign material, devitalized tissue but it's not supposed to be there. It's in a pathological state because it's creating disease. See, there are abnormal tissues in your body, but they're not necessarily pathological. For something to be pathological, it has to cause disease or pathology. So this is pathological tissue. We are removing pathological tissue because it's causing disease, pain pain and neurological dysfunction. Sean, can you make sure we have a fresh pot of coffee, please? I'm almost done. I need my, my coffee fix. Will do. Look at that piece of calcified disc material right there. Let's get that guy. Stand by. <sighs> I never get tired of doing these surgeries um, because they make such a profound difference in people's lives. And <coughs> if you all remember, it was about a week ago, we did a laser surgery, L45, L5S1. The patient, uh, I tried to get into L5S1, but I couldn't. It, and it turned out, I thought, you know, this patient's disc seems fused. We ended up um, sending off a lab called HLA-B27. And it turned out the patient has ankylosing spondylitis, which means their discs fuse automatically. It's in an auto... Uh, inflammatory condition. So he was very grateful that we made the diagnosis. Nobody had ever diagnosed him with that. And his back pain is 100% gone. He's very happy. I'm so sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yes, yeah, HL, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, which is what HLA-B27 is a serological marker for. Bamboo spine, good job, Luis. It, it causes an auto fusion of the spine. Now, I saw the patient yesterday, he's doing a phenomenal. He has no pain, he's very happy. But um, he's 73 years old, so he has a milder form of the ankylosing spondylitis. And uh, not all of his discs are fused at 73. If you have a severe form, you're gonna be fused at you know 30s. And it's a horrible condition because that fusion, auto fusion, is so painful for patients that have it. They just suffer with pain every day. It's, it's terrible. But it's not a surgically fixable condition, okay? Now, he did have a herniated disc, and I fixed it at L4-5. And that took his back pain away. So I created comfort and happiness and joy in a, a person's life who, you know, unfortunately has other conditions that I can't fix that are gonna end up 
causing eventually problems for him with pain. So right now he's pain free as a result of the Duke laser disc repair and he has a diagnosis as to why his spine is fusing itself as a result of coming to Duke Spine Institute. Something that was missed by all the other doctors, of course, which is very common for us to see that. Unfortunately, doctors these days have gotten very sloppy. There's no pride, in my opinion, for most of them in their work. I don't know why, but maybe they're just over overworked, maybe they're spending too much time on electronic medical records and not focused on the patient anymore. But for me, I have a very strong sense of what a good doctor does as a result of my father who was a doctor. He always put his patients first. They loved him for it. And I saw how much happiness his work brought him, satisfaction. And I understood what needed to be done to be a good doctor. You had to take the best care of the patient. So I brought that with me into my career. Unfortunately, there are many doctors who don't believe that. So we're stuck with our medical system the way it is. And it, I don't think it's unique to this country. I think it's actually a problem all over the world. So these are all pieces of herniation that are floating out. And I decided to float it out rather than grab it with the pituitaries. I could have done the pituitary as well. But my pituitary, when it has a big herniation like that, it actually gets stuck in the tube because the mouth can't close all the way. So then the, the diameter of the pituitary is too wide and it won't fit out the tube. So there's the tear, by the way. And we're all mo and the end and the end plate of L4 is right there. You see the little blood coming out of it, the pinkish thing? That's actually bone. So this is the end of the tear right here at L L45. This is what I, I've come to repair. This is the last of it. I've been repairing it. And when I say repairing it, what I'm really doing is I'm debriding it. So it's trying to repair itself. I can't repair the annulus myself. I can only clean it up so that it can heal itself, which is what I'm doing. That's the Duke laser disc repair procedure. That's the only surgery in the world that debrides the annular tear so that it will heal itself. And we published this result in 2012. We we're the first in the world to publish it, an annular debridement. I think we may still be the only ones to have published it in the National Library of Medicine. The journal is called Surgical Neurology International. It was peer reviewed and published. My peers absolutely hated the fact that I discovered the cure to back pain and neck pain. Why? Because neurosurgeons are very jealous people and they're not happy that they didn't discover it. They're not just neurosurgeons, they're spine surgeons. So like me, their specialty is spine. And there's nothing that men or women hate more than knowing that one of their colleagues discovered something significant and they didn't do it. So there's a lot of jealousy issues, which frankly I don't care about. I'm, I'm happy for people when they make discoveries. I'm happy to see medicine progress. I mean, for God's sakes, 99.999% of what I know comes from other people's discoveries and I'm very happy they made those discoveries. What upsets me is that my colleagues, even though they know this discovery exists, will not promote it or publish it because they themselves don't do it. They don't know how to do it. They don't have the equipment to do it. They don't have the millions to spend or don't want to spend it. They don't have the knowledge and experience to do this type of surgery, even though I've tried teaching them. 
So I decided I was gonna give up on my, my peers, my colleagues, my neurosurgery brethren, because their focus is elsewhere. Their focus is on things that I don't believe are very important to patients. Their own egos and their own wealth and riches. I was reading in the paper that one of my neurosurgery colleagues, he's a neurosurgeon, been a neurosurgeon for years. I won't mention his name, but he, he sued Medtronic sophomore Danik for a uh, screw system that honestly is not a big deal and he was just awarded his $200 million. So you got a lot of these surgeons who are so busy just thinking about how they can make more money for themselves rather than how they can improve patient's life. And so they're very distracted. And that's the culture. That's the neurosurgery culture today. That's the orthopedic surgery culture. Though I have to admit, in my experience, orthopedic surgeons are a little better than neurosurgeons. They actually understand pain a little bit better and they try to fix it for patients. Neurosurgeons don't believe you can cure pain. They don't wanna do surgery for pain. They don't wanna talk about pain, back pain, neck pain. They just wanna talk about pinched nerves and pinched spinal cords. And pinched nerves account for a very small number of patients with symptoms from pinched nerves. Certainly it occurs, but the patient's primary concern is always their back pain or their neck pain, which is ignored by no, most neurosurgeons, probably 99% of them. So yes, I had to branch out and do things different. Yes, we, we broadcast these surgeries so the patients and the people that want to learn, nurses, doctors, surgeons, primary care doctors, whoever, you know, chiropractors, they all want to learn the truth about how to cure pain, this is it right here. We're showing you the truth. I had the same opportunities to make hundreds of millions of dollars with uh, working with implant companies and I chose not to, I chose rather to cure pain without implants. And that's what the Duke Laser Disc Repair does. We're done at this disc. Right on, please. No, no, just this disc, yeah. So there's the epidural space at 12 o'clock. There's a vein right there. The nerve root is gonna be right up here. Right there, you see the white thing? That's the nerve root. All right, so you see how close the herniation was to the nerve root, it was right in the, we call it the axilla or the armpit. So all my neurosurgery colleagues are busy focusing on practices that do fusion or artificial discs, putting in spinal implants to fix pain. I focused on not putting in spinal implants but doing a more natural solution for back and neck pain, which is the Duke Laser Disc Repair. You won't see us put a single screw or rod or cage in today. We won't put any biological material today, <laughs> though that may change in the future as I'm working on some ideas, which I won't share yet. yet. But um, this is an all natural surgery. There's a cut, there's a repair of the annulus, a debridement with the laser and then we're done. There's no metal or hardware, so the companies that control those implants, they're not happy with me because I'm changing the way spine surgery is done and I have better results than spinal fusions. I have better results than robotic spine surgery. We have better results than artificial discs. We have better results than traditional surgeries like laminectomy, microdiscectomy. We have better results than any, any treatment in the world for discogenic pain with the Duke laser disc repair. And they're all not happy with me because they're not making money off of it. That's really what it comes down to. They is in the implant companies, the big promoters and marketers of spine surgery around the world.
One of my most influential teachers was a man, a doctor named Dr. Young, Dr. Tony Young out of Phoenix, Arizona. Dr. Young is a true pioneer in endoscopic spine surgery. He taught me several of the basic principles. Okay, but he's retired now. He's teaching in China, but his son is an orthopedic spine surgeon. His son, I won't mention his name, his son had the golden opportunity of a lifetime to take what his father helped develop and pioneer in the United States as one of the very first, if not the first, for lumbar transforaminal endoscopic surgery. He taught me, I, I listened and I followed his instructions. His son was turned to the dark side. He became an orthopedic surgeon and all he wants to do is fusions and put implants in. Why? I don't know why, I can't answer that for you, but I suspect it's because he wants to be more mainstream. You know, all of his colleagues and friends are doing fusions and screws and rods and cages and artificial discs, so why not? You know, be part of the team, be part of the, the herd. Certainly that's how I started. I started out the same way. I was trained to be one of the best complex instrumentation, reconstructive spine surgeons in the country with my training. However. When I saw this surgery done overseas in Korea and by Dr. Young, I saw the potential for minimally invasive and how great it could be. At the time, they were all treating pinched nerves and leg pain, but I saw, I found an avenue to treat back pain as well, thoracic pain, cervical pain, and now that's what we're doing. We don't stop at treating leg pain. We treat back pain and cure back pain just as well. So I modified the techniques that they taught me to get down to the disc and develop the annular debridement, which is the Duke Laser Disc Repair Signature Procedure. All right. We are ready to do our L34. It's our last disc. Um, I wasn't even really planning to do it. It's consented, right? We have consent to do it. And the reason why we weren't planning to do it is because when he pointed to where his pain was, he pointed to the L3 to S1 region I looked at his MRI and certainly there's a herniated disc at L34 as there is at L45, L5S1, but I just didn't think it looked bad enough to be causing pain. And as I've told you all many times before, you cannot look at an MRI at a disc and tell if it's causing pain, ever. The only thing you can do is look at an MRI and see if the disc is normal or if it's been damaged. And I can tell you a large number of patients that we fix, they cure their pain, they have MRIs that by radiologists, they read their discs as slight bu bulge or bulging disc or uh, broad base disc herniation, things that other surgeons would just ignore. But it turns out that that disc is the cause of the patient's pain. And when we fix it with a laser surgery, the pain goes away. So what I'm getting at is with this patient, I had a low suspicion that this disc would need to be fixed because on the MRI it just didn't look that bad and L45, L5S1 looked worse. So I had a feeling 4551 just because of probabilities that they would be the cause of the pain because they're the most common cause. But I said to the patient, I'll test L34 because it may be a cause and if it is a cause, we'll fix it. So we tested it. He had nine out of 10 pain um, and it was concordant, meaning that's his typical daily pain he always gets. And when I put the needle in, as a matter of fact, I made mention to Luis, I could feel the annular tear. I could feel the tear in the annulus in the, in the back. So when I can feel the annular tear as I'm putting the needle in, it's a big tear. And that means it's probably symptomatic. So long story short, we're fixing it because I believe it needs to be fixed. And we've proven that it is a source of pain, okay? So that's why we're fixing it, because I confirmed with the discogram that indeed it was causing pain. It was a 9 out of 10 pain, okay, 9 out of 10 pain, and the other discs were, were 10 out of 10 pain. So <laughs> I mean 9 out of 10 pain is not something I want my patient going home with at the end of the surgery. So I need to fix it as a surgeon. but the, the the point of this story is very important 
And sometimes I, I ramble a little bit, but don't lose focus on why I'm talking about it. The point of the story is, number one, an MRI doesn't tell you which disc caused pain, okay? They either do or they don't, and it's your job as a good surgeon to figure out which ones do and which ones don't. And the discogram, second point, discogram, intraoperative, evocative discogram, or even preoperative, is a great tool to figure that out. It's the only tool that will tell you. And that's why we do it on every surgery with every disc that we treat. You understand? So the dilator is advancing. I want to pull it back just a little bit before it gets any further. So number one, the MRI won't tell you which discs are painful. They only guide you. The physical exam won't tell you for sure which discs are painful. They only guide, it only guides you. A discogram will tell you which discs are painful, but it's an invasive procedure and you really want to avoid doing it unless you're committed to doing surgery, unless the patient's committed and you're committed. So there's a lot of lessons here, but now that we know it is painful, I want to fix it for him so he doesn't go home with a painful disc. Mm. Heesh, they're stuck together. <laughs> I need to unstick them. There we go. Wait, shot. All right, that was better. Now, wait a second. I want to think through this for just a moment. Yeah, I think that's the right tool. Shot, that should be good. That's good. Okay. So, never underestimate a bulging disc or small, 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 small disc herniations ability to cause horrendous back pain or neck pain, thoracic pain, okay? Never judge a book by its cover. Never ever look at an MRI and say that disc herniation is too small to be causing the symptoms for the patient because you will be dead wrong 90% of the time. What I look for is any abnormality of the disc, any, even a tiny abnormality, tiny ones that even other surgeons and doctors would say, no, nothing significant. They're wrong. They just don't know. And you can't necessarily blame them for not knowing, though I do. Um, it's their responsibility to know. I hate seeing radiologists under-read MRIs because they, they think that the disc herniation is not significant clinically. How would they know? They've never examined a patient. They sit behind a computer screen all day and they look at MRIs. They don't know if those discs cause pain or not. And so the last thing in the world you want to do is listen to a radiologist talking about clinical, which is the effects of, dis of abnormalities seen on the MRI. They have no clue. Okay, sorry radiologist, but it's the truth. I can't tell you how many times I've seen radiologists make those mistakes. So if, you've been, if you have chronic back or neck pain, if you have thoracic pain, and you don't know why, and nobody's fixed it for you, send your MRI to Duke Spine, and we will figure out what's causing your pain, and we will certainly fix it for you. All right, I need to get this out. I guess it's still, can you check this um, when we're done and just see if yes, if this dilator is bent or something? It may be bent a little bit, and that may be why it's uh, getting stuck. But there's some tissue there too. See the tissue there, guys yeah, and gals? Yeah. That's 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 disc material, disc herniation. That's kind of wedged in between the tubular retractor and the dilator. All right, so, so far we fixed two painful discs, L45, L5S1, using a tiny seven millimeter incision. Band-Aid incision with the Duke laser disc repair. It's only done at Duke Spine Institute. You have to come to Florida to get the surgery. Sorry, until I clone myself and my team, you gotta come here. We had a, a person ask, a week or two ago, if we would come to Canada 
to do the surgery. And I said, Sean said, no, we just do it here. And I told Sean, no, 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 no. We'll go to Canada. I'll have to fly the entire team there, but just let them know, you know, that it's an option. So we will fly anywhere in the world with the team and our equipment. As long as there's a facility, a hospital or surgery center, we can do the surgery at. So, but you know, don't get sticker shock when you hear how expensive it's gonna be. Because flying an entire surgery team around the world and the equipment and logistics and coordination is not cheap. But I'm open to it. Luis already told me he's ready to travel. He's got a new bathing suit he wants to show off. <laughs> right? So, you know, ha I guess you could say have, it, have equipment, we'll travel. Have team, we'll travel um, on our website, Sean. I hope you're chuckling over there, Sean. I am. Yeah, we just need to update our passports. That's the other thing, right? <laughs> uh, but like I said, there's no one else in the world that does the surgery this way. And uh, pretty much everywhere else you go, you're going to need metal or fusion to be getting yourself out of pain. But this is the most advanced spine surgery in the world currently for treating back and neck pain from a herniated disc. And we got to bring Patel too, because I need his help in case they have facets or piriformis or SI. So we got to bring his team as well. Might as well just rent the entire plane, <laughs> right? Banff, you want to go to Banff? Absolutely. I would love to go to Banff. I've never been there. I've wanted to go. But I heard that that's far away from the airport, right? Isn't it like two hours or two and a half hours? I hope if you don't break down, right? That would suck. I'm sure it's cold at night. I guess nowadays they have all kinds of ways of dealing with breakdowns along the way. Of course, there's a piece of herniation right there. Oh yeah, got part of it. So what I can tell you so far with this particular disc herniation, L3-4, is that A, it's painful because we tested it with the discogram. B, it's actually um, softer. So it's a more recent injury. It's not as old of an injury as the L5-S1 and the L4-5, which had a lot more calcium. There's a piece of herniation. And the L5-S1 honestly was the worst. It was the oldest injury. Probably that's the original. So just looking at herniated discs in the lumbar spine and which ones cause pain, L4-5 is the most common to cause pain. And I think L5-S1 is just right behind it. Um, but we have... Like I said, a thousand of these surgeries. And when we went back and looked at our data, I think L4-5 was the most common and L5-S1 the second most common. And that's pretty much what other doctors have found as well over the years about which ones are symptomatic herniations. Of course, they're talking about leg symptoms and radiculopathy. We're talking about back pain so it's a slightly different discussion, but all due to the same disc causing two different types of symptoms. One, pinched nerve or irritated nerve symptoms, and the other, axial pain or back pain symptoms. Any questions from our audience? None so far. We're gonna be done in five minutes, and I'll head back to the conference room and answer some questions for you, okay? so. If you're part of the audience watching, a couple of things I'd like to say. Number one, Duke Spine Institute has a free app, the Duke Spine Institute. Sorry, yeah, Duke Spine Institute app. So all you gotta do is go to your app store and download it for free. It's got valuable information that I think is uh, very helpful, including videos and 
a library uh, of information. If you want to get a free MRI review to find out why you're having your pain or a free Skype, we offer those every week. Usually the Skypes are on Friday. Um, standby laser. We also uh, have a Facebook spine support group. It's free and it's called the Spine Surgery Support Group. So look it up and join. The only thing I would say is if you're, uh, you're trying to sell something like surgical tools, don't bother. I've had to block a couple of people who are trying to sell surgical instruments to a spine surgery support group. I'm not sure why. The spine surgery support group is really for people who are suffering with back or neck pain and would like some advice and help either from a doctor or a surgeon like us or other patients who have suffered as well and have maybe found relief, remedy. And so that's really what it's about. Um, you don't have to be considering surgery or even have had surgery to go there. It's just for people that have basically spine problems and we're not going to try to sell you cannabis oil, but we're going to talk about diagnoses and, and real treatments that work, not just covering it up with uh, drugs. We don't promote the use of drugs or pills or pain medication to cure pain because it doesn't. It only makes people addicted. We're believers in curing pain by getting to the source, okay, and fixing it. I know for many people it's a foreign concept. If you've lived with back pain for years and years and you've never found a cure and you've talked to thousands of people that have never found a cure, then you're going to believe that there is no way to cure back pain because that's all you've heard your whole life, your whole existence, is that back pain can't be cured. Well, now it can. The cure is this procedure you're watching right now, the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Unfortunately, the doctors where you live don't know how to do it, unless you live here where we are, and you're going to have to travel to get it done. But you have stumbled across that cure, and that's the good news. What you do with that knowledge and information is up to you. If you want to continue to live in pain, that's your choice. We're not here to, to force you to get your back fixed. <laughs> We're here to, to tell you it can be done and show you it can be done. We have countless videos, hundreds and hundreds of patients that have had the surgery, this exact surgery, and have had been cured of their pain. We have no patients that are not cured of their pain because they don't exist. There's always a reason for pain to happen. And it's just a matter of figuring it out, why it happened. And that's what we do at Duke Spine Institute. So we don't just sit around and do Duke laser disc repairs all day. What we do is we figure out why people have their pain by doing tests and physical exam, history. And then sometimes we want to send you for a block, a diagnostic block. But basically what we do 90% of the time is try to figure out why people have pain and then come up with the best treatment option. So there's not a single patient that comes here that we can't cure of their pain, uh, except for somebody with fibromyalgia, okay? So fibromyalgia is the only pain condition we can't cure. And um, there are some other very rare, rare conditions, um, which I will also say cancer pain, for example, we can't cure, but we can certainly help treat. There's ways of treating that. So, but the pain that we cure is degenerative pain, pain from a degenerative disc, herniated disc, bulging disc, facet joints that are degenerative. Those are all curable causes of pain, and that's probably 98% of people's chronic pain comes from curable sources. So that's the message. You don't have to live with chronic pain. You can get it fixed. We're not the only place in the world that can fix chronic pain. There's others, but we just do it better than anyone else. So if you care about having a low chance of complication, if you want a ha high chance of success, then come to a center that 
that does it all the time. Are you almost out of irrigation? Because I'm just about done in about 30 seconds. All right. I was noticing that it seemed like it, the flow was a little low. So ten seconds, unless I find something weird here. This is the L34 disc once again. This is the one that we weren't sure he would need treatment, but we consented him for it because. Uh, when I looked at the MRI, I thought there's definitely a possibility based on the MRI, based on where he's pointing his pain to be, but I felt certain that L45 and L5S1 were definitely the causes of pain. It turns out L34 was as well. So understand that a lot of surgeons only treat one disc problem at a time, so you're going to go to surgery, they're going to fuse one level, even though you may need three, even though you may need two. That means you're going to come out of surgery with that surgeon still having pain. And that doesn't sit well with me. Maybe you're okay with that, but I like to fix it all when I'm in there. A lot of surgeons don't do that because it takes a lot of time. Every disc takes more time to fuse or fix for them. So they're gonna end up trying to do one at a time, which means they're committing you to having more than one surgery or living with back pain after your surgery. That's part of the reason there's so many people with chronic back pain even after having surgery on their spine because the surgeon didn't fix all the discs that needed to be fixed. Here you saw us fix three discs in one surgery for this patient. And because of that, I believe his, he's going to have a cure. All of his pain from before surgery is going to be gone. That's what I expect with him. Okay. I would be very surprised if he has any pain after the surgery. Okay, so we're pretty much done. I know it took me a few seconds longer than I thought it would, but that's the healthy annulus right there, what's left of it, and the posterior ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament. Okay, laser off. We'll just take a quick look at the nerve. It's going to be up here. There's a lot of fat around it. And there's some ligament right there, foramenal ligament. So you can't really see the nerve here. Because, hold on a second, Luis, I need to get that right there. That's a lateral piece of herniation. I just want to get that. Um, the can't see the nerve like we did the other one because it's buried in all that fat. There's fat around the nerve root because the nerve is very metabolically active. So it uses energy, and fat is a great storage form of energy in the body. It's the most efficient way to store energy. That's why humans don't store energy is glycogen or glucose or ATP very much or NADPH or FADH2. We store energy primarily as fat and that's because fat's a very efficient way of storing energy. It takes up very little space. It doesn't require water to solubilize it because it's hydrophobic. So it's a very, very, very efficient way to store energy. Anyway, that's why there's fat around the nerve root to give that nerve energy. All right, thanks everyone for watching. Type up your questions. I wanna show you the incision real quick. Let me have that. Let's get the light on. So let me have the tube. So let me show you this tube real quick, all right? We just took out. Can you see this, Sean? Yes, we can. All right, you see that? So the entire endoscopic surgery, three herniated discs repaired with a tube this wide, right through the center. You see the center? Now, if we did this as a fusion, what every other surgeon was doing, the incision would be this long. It'd be as long as the tube. Instead, our incision was, you'll see it in a second, but it was just wide enough to get the tube in. All three discs were fixed with the tube. I went in and fixed L5S1 this way, and then we took it out and we redirected it and put it into the L45, then we took it out, redirected it, and put it into L34. I used to make separate incisions for each disc, and then I realized I could do them 
I could do them all with one incision 99% of the time. And of course, it's better to have one incision than three. Are you awake? Your surgery's done. You did fantastic. We got all three discs fixed. Well, don't jump for joy. <laughs> all right. He's, he's following my instructions. He, yeah, he's following my instructions. I told him don't move, so he's not jumping for joy. All right, you see that right there, folks? There's the incision. Yes. And as Luis pointed out, this is our last surgery for the year of 2020. Oh, my gosh. It is, huh? So I'm not doing surgery next week. I'm out of town. Well, last surgery, 2020. Happy holidays, everyone. Uh, Merry Christmas if you celebrate Christmas, which I do. Because, after all, that's when Santa comes. <laughs> all right, type your questions up. And uh, I'll be over in the conference room in about two minutes. Sean, you want to take over? We'll put a Band-Aid on that. We'll be done. All right, everyone, Dr. Duke will be in the room with us to answer your remaining questions shortly. If you look on the screen now, you'll see we have the patient's MRI report up. You can see the levels we just operated on, which was L3, L4, L4, L5, and L5S1. The report does denote disc desiccation, disc bulges, and annular fissures and tears at those three levels, which we all noted on physical examination through discogram and EMG. Now keep in mind an MRI is only one diagnostic measure we use to start the workup of treatment. You may need other diagnostic tests before your surgeon commits to any kind of surgery, but oftentimes we like to go back and review the MRI report just to see that it does confirm first thing the levels that we operated on. If you feel the need to get diagnosed for surgery, we can review your MRI for free. Go ahead and visit the link on the page, mri.dukespine.com. If you have access to your imaging, you can upload it there, and Dr. Duke will give you his opinion free of charge. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us in the room for the post-op Q&A. Dr. Duke is here with us to answer any of your remaining questions, so go ahead and type them up in the chat now. For now, I'm going to hand the microphone over to him. He'll talk a little bit about the case you just watched.
Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Okay, well, in the last surgery of the year 2020, this is the Duke Laser Disc Repair. That's the, the name of the surgery. That's what it's called. Um, there's many different types of spinal surgery that are available around the world. There are some that are more commonly done than others. Um, generally, the more common surgeries are that are done are the older surgeries. Um, that's because that's what surgeons know how to do. That knowledge and information about how to do those surgeries uh, began disseminating around the world to different countries many years ago, about 100 years ago. So let's say about 100 years ago, um, we started as spine surgeons doing what's called a laminectomy. And that's where you go and make a big incision in the back of the spine and open up the bones, open the roof of the spine by removing the bones that are back there. The laminectomy has very, very limited ability to, to help patients, okay? And the kind of patients that laminectomies help um, are ones with severe spinal stenosis from overgrowth of their facet joints and broad-based disc herniations and congenital stenosis, all those things added together ligamentous hypertrophy. So the people who used to get laminectomies 100 years ago basically couldn't walk anymore. And the good news is we don't have to wait anymore until people can't walk, though I'll be perfectly honest with you. When I was in my training, I heard some of my attending spine surgeons tell patients, wait for surgery until you can't walk anymore. And at the time, I thought that was normal because obviously I was in a training situation. I didn't know any better. And this is what my, my professor was telling his patients you know, as part of his practice. So, and that was something I had heard all over the world. You know, surgeons telling their patients, wait till you can't walk anymore before you do back surgery. So it was pretty standard to say that, um, pretty standard belief. But the truth is, folks, and that's why we do these broadcasts, God's honest truth is you should never wait till you can't walk anymore. That was absolutely 100% the wrong thing to tell people because we can fix these problems now very early. And we also know something even more important. It's called the natural history of the disease. And the natural history of the disease is something that everyone should understand about every disease that they have or they have to encounter. For example, the natural history of cancer is death. You're going to die if you have cancer unless there's a cure. And so cancer spreads throughout your body and it continues to spread. The cancerous cells grow and divide. They then break off of the clump and they spread to another place and then they start growing there. And so um, cancer is, is something that in natural history we understand very well it ultimately ends up in death through various mechanisms. Now, if you have an opportunity to stop that natural history early on, why wouldn't you? Spine diseases like degenerative conditions of the spine, they ultimately lead to a fate worse than death. And I don't give a damn if you don't understand what I'm saying or don't believe me. It just means you're ignorant to the needs of the people who suffer with chronic back pain and neck pain and degenerative conditions. So some people will challenge me and that's fine. You can challenge me in your own little mind and your own little world. The reality of it is that I've seen and treated tens of thousands of patients with these conditions in my career and treated them with the most advanced treatments in the world. And I've seen the difference it makes on their lives and, and their lives of their families and children and wives and husbands and spouses and parents and everyone else around them, most importantly, the patient's life. The reality is, is that these people suffer and having chronic back pain where you suffer every day and not able to live normal life is literally torture. And no human being should have to live through chronic back or chronic neck pain every day and be tortured, okay? So for the doctors, for the healthcare advocates and for the people that choose to ignore that fact that it's curable now and don't want to spread that word, you are my enemy. You are the reason I'm online, is to dispel the myths and to spread truth. 
The truth is, is that back and neck pain can be cured. It just requires the right diagnosis and the right treatment. The other truth is, is that, and this is the part of the bad part, is that many people don't have access to the treatment for various reasons. Either they don't know it exists, they've been told it doesn't, or they live too far away to travel here, or they don't have the money and resources or insurance that will pay for their treatment. In the end, all those reasons don't change the single most important fact, is that chronic back and neck pain can be cured. Now, how you get to the cure, that's the real challenge. And that's why we advocate at Duke Spine Institute the truth be known to everyone so that people can start working towards getting that cure. Do we have any questions? All right, I have my director of nursing sitting next to me and she has something to talk to me about. So I'm gonna wrap this session up. Once again, this is our last surgery for year 2020. Our patient had a Duke laser disc repair. It's peer reviewed and published in the National Library of Medicine. Um, and the procedure is very, very effective at curing back and neck pain when done properly. So everyone have a great holiday season and we look forward to a much better 2021, hopefully with the COVID virus all behind us and everyone moving forward and hopefully no other country developing any bioterrorism weapons and releasing them on the world. It can be the world is a hard enough place as it is. We, uh, we need to do our best, everyone, to make it a better place for everyone. So, Sean, do you want to add anything? Last words of 2020? I just want to say to all of our viewers on Periscope, have a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Keep in touch in the next year. In 2021, Periscope will be shutting down and migrating to Twitter. We'll keep you updated on all of our social media pages and how you can catch our live streams in the future. All right. Thank you, everyone.